this week on The Travel Show. Celebrating the world's most famous big wheel. This is brilliant. This is my London. A slice of Britain on a remote Japanese island. Hope I'm doing this right. You've got to be fast. Oh. And racing to the finishing line in our icy Siberian challenge. <laughs> Welcome to The Travel Show with me, Carmen Roberts, coming to you this week from Japan's semi-tropical Yeyama Islands. Later on, I'll be serving up one of these islands' most surprising culinary specialties, a big, battered British favourite, fish and chips. But first... The world's tallest observation wheel is now up and running in where else but Dubai. It's known as the Dubai Eye. It's 250 metres tall and has 48 pods, which means it can carry more than 1,700 people in one revolution. Shortly after the millennium, the world's most famous big wheel was opened. And just as the pandemic hit, the London Eye was busy celebrating its 20th birthday. So we went along to meet some of the people who made it happen. The Romans established London nearly 2,000 years ago. Since then, the historic capital has developed an iconic skyline. For generations of us, it's always been dominated by two or three instantly recognisable historic buildings. When I was a kid, you could pick out St Paul's Cathedral, Tower Bridge and the Palace of Westminster as three silhouettes which made the skyline look great. And that was the case for more than 100 years and you kind of knew where you were. And then exactly 20 years ago, that was all thrown up in the air because that arrived. Located on the banks of the River Thames, the London Eye offers a panoramic 360-degree view over the capital. Standing at 135 metres tall, it's still the largest observation wheel in Europe and the most popular, with more than 76 million visitors in the last two decades. It was opened back in the heady days of the year 2000, part of the celebrations that ushered in the new millennium. Originally, it was only supposed to be a temporary structure with a lifespan of just five years. Exciting. Um, it has been a while since I was first on it, and it's still hugely popular. Okay, here we go. The big step. It's actually going at less than one kilometre an hour, but nonetheless, you've got to get on in time. So here we are, 135 metres high, right at the top. And this is brilliant. This is my London. I know this place really well. I was born just over there. I live just over there. And every iconic building you want to see is here. Buckingham Palace, the Millennium Bridge, St Paul's over there, the River Thames. It's fantastic. This is London's equivalent of the Eiffel Tower and the Empire State Building. This is the view that everybody wants to get. Yeah. Okay, we're about to get off. Our time is done, 30 minutes. And it's all over. The 
the architects were David Marks and Julia Barfield, a renowned husband and wife team. Julia, just take me to the beginning of this whole project. How did it all start? Well, it started with a competition in 1993. And what the competition called for was a landmark to celebrate the millennium. The competition was abandoned, but David and Julia decided to plow on regardless. David sadly died in 2017, but Julia still has great memories of that time. Now, I think this is the prototype, if you like. We looked at so many different designs for the actual structure. You know, it's huge, but we wanted it to be light in feeling. So we looked at very many different um, engineering solutions for that um, with different geometries. And then this, this seemed to be the optimal geometry in the end to make it very light. It was disappointing that the judges didn't think any of the ideas were good enough, but you know we thought it was a good idea. So we started a company which was called the Millennium Wheel Company, and um, we put in a planning application. We gradually got more and more um, exposure to the project, and um, we did deal with British Airways, and we put a lot of our own money in, mm. but we, we mortgaged the house and whatever. But um, then they, they gave us some serious money in order to be able to properly pay engineers. And so it, it kind of had a snowball effect, really. Um, and because it was at that extraordinary time of the millennium, you know, I feel that, you know, something extraordinary could happen. <laughs> but it wasn't all plain sailing. There were still some people who were unconvinced. Did anybody say, listen, look at it, it's a horrible eyesore. It looks, it's ruining the, the skyline. Yes, no, they did, absolutely. Um, so when we were doing the consultations, we went to the Royal Fine Art Commission and the chairman of the Royal Fine Art Commission did not like it at all. He was apoplectically against it. Um, so there were people who were against it, of course. And even now, I mean, all and even, even all, now, uh, well, some people say, oh. Well, yes, I mean, I'm sure there are some people who don't like it, but, um, you know, that's... Um, you know, you can't have everything. <laughs> there were 32 capsules in all, representing the 32 London boroughs. Each of them had to be floated down the Thames and installed one by one. It's one thing to actually design a structure on a piece of paper or in a computer programme, but to actually then build it on site is a completely different set of challenges. They built the London Eye kind of flat on the river, so it was much easier to attach all the different parts of it. And then once it was nearly finished, they craned it up into its final position. So some really, really clever construction and engineering went behind this structure. In the last 20 years, the London Eye has become something of a minnow. It's been overtaken by big observation wheels in Las Vegas, Singapore and Dubai. But for ex-London Mayor Ken Livingstone, it isn't just about the wheel. People come from all over the world to be here and all over the rest of Britain. We've got more you know, restaurants than Paris or New York. We've got more bars. We've got more museums, more cinemas. This is an amazing city to live in. There's so much you can do. You fought for it to survive. Would you fight for it to survive for the foreseeable future? I think it could be here in 100 years' time. I mean, they've just got to keep patching it up, repairing it when things go wrong. Um, people are always going to want to come and take their kids on this I mean, and, and have that amazing view across the whole stretch of London. The skyline is changing all the time, with dozens more skyscrapers in development, each one causing its own controversies. But now you hardly hear anything about this iconic structure being an eyesore. Not bad for something that was supposed to be torn down 15 years ago. Well, stay with us. We've got lots of great stuff coming up after the break. We'll be seeing how good old British fish and chips go down on a tropical Japanese island. Really good. I think it's the actual best fish and chips I've ever tasted. <laughs> And we'll be catching up with our three hardy Lithuanian adventurers as their mission to cross the frozen Lake Baikal in Russia draws to a close. I have another idea. 
so don't go away. The humble fish and chips is a staple of the Great British Diet, one that I've been missing since moving from the UK 10 years ago. But I'm in luck. I've been told this traditional takeaway has finally arrived on Japanese shores in the unlikeliest of places. I've traveled to a small island south of Okinawa to try it out. So we're making our way across Ishigaki Island. It was a three hour plane journey from Tokyo and we're actually around 400 kilometers from the Okinawa main island itself. We're actually closer to Taiwan than we are to Japan. So I've been to Ishigaki a few times. It's an easy island getaway from Tokyo. And while I've had a lot of good seafood here, I've never actually had British fish and chips. You must be Sam, hi. Hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> so tell me about Bonnie Blue and your, and your business here, Sam. We try and do a kind of UK style fish and chips with beer batter, but we use Okinawan beer and we use local fish and um, nori seaweed on the chips as well. And what do the locals think of this fish and chips with the beer batter? In Ishigaki, people love fish and they love deep fried food as well. So I think it fits in nicely with um, with the kind of food that people like, but it's also something new for everyone to try. But there was no time for yapping. I needed to learn how to make this British classic before the lunchtime rush arrived. So Sam, what's your secret? Well, I won't tell you my secrets, but you can give me a hand. Okay. Here's some gloves. This fish is local Okinawan fish. It's uh, hiromachi, so it's a cold water, white fleshed fish. Great. And it's delicious. Before every single order, we get fresh beer. Whoa. <laughs> it's bubbly. So why do you use fresh beer? We want the bubbles to make it nice and fresh so that when the batter goes into the oil, it's going to bubble up and be really nice and crispy. So the consistency is very important. It has to be just right. So Like this? Yeah, I think that's perfect. We're going to cover the fish in the batter and then as you drop it in the oil, you want to kind of brush it. Oh. A little bit like that. Okay, and then I'm just going to drop these chips in as well. And then if you could do the other two fish. How's my brushing technique? For the first time, it's okay. I've never done this before. Wow. <laughs> if we have a lot of orders on, you're going to have to right. get them in there. Got to pick up the pace. Yeah, come on. It's my first ever fish and chips. Just when I thought it was my time for a break, I had to get to grips with another of their delicacies, a deep fried Snickers bar. Yes, you heard right, a deep fried chocolate bar. Sam's wife, Kumi, was on hand to show me how this famous Scottish dish was made. Can you smell it? Mm, you yeah. can smell the chocolate. Mm -hmm. Really bubbling. Mm -hmm. All right, small bite, here we go. Mmm. This side was a bit more gooey. Less peanuts. Mmm. Not sure I want to get in my bikini after this. But there was no time for a quick dip or sunbathe anyway. So we've got a bit of a lunchtime rush and I'm finding it a bit stressful. Since the pandemic, lots of British expats have struggled to leave Japan. And so it's of no surprise that a taste of home is just what the Brits are after. We've got a lot of orders up here. It's maybe about five or six fish and chips to do. Seven, eight, eight orders. Do you get stressed, Sam, with this big lunch hour rush? No, when in Ishigaki, everything is island time. Island time. Yeah, we have the beach and everyone's happy to wait a little bit, so. It's got to look just right. Yes, please. Presentation is everything. This is my reputation on the way. <laughs> I'm feeling the pressure. There's hungry hordes out the front of the van. I hope I'm doing this right. You've got to be fast. Oh. Too much. <laughs> I can't remember the chip placement. Sam, you work fast. This is good. 
You've done this before. Once or twice. Here's your fish and chips. Ooh, thank you. There you go. Please don't drop it. Here you go. <laughs> After all that hard graft, what did the customers think? I really like the chips because they got a nice texture to them. Um, it's, it's beautiful. Really, really, really nice. And the fish is just crunchy enough. So far, so good. But now for the real test. The deep fried Snickers bar. <laughs> You're not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> did you expect it to be so good? No, I didn't. Deep fried Snickers, ugh. It's gorgeous. But not everyone is convinced. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really bad. <laughs> oh well, everyone loved the main course at least, and I've certainly enjoyed my time making these exotic mm. takes on British classics. It's really good. Who would have thought a chippy van would have made it here to an island over 6,000 miles away from the UK? And people say British food doesn't travel well. <laughs> well, think again. Next up, we're headed to Russia, where for the past two weeks we've joined an intrepid trio of adventurers as they make their way across the frozen surface of Lake Baikal, the world's largest freshwater lake. Last week, we left Carolus, Jurgis and Max braving minus 30 degree temperatures as they tried navigating an ice crack that stretched on for kilometers. And they're doing it all in an open-topped car dating back to the Soviet era. We rejoin them on the final leg of their journey, in much more comfortable circumstances, warming up at one of the hot springs dotted around the lake. It's only 40 kilometers to our destination. And Mark says we shouldn't celebrate yet, even though it's maybe just some hours of drive. We never know for sure what's... Right, Max? Last um, night Babushka, showed again is... Babushka is not... The most reliable car, you know that. She is reliable, but tired. And, and ourselves, we are not in best condition anyway now, so... Max, can you sing, sing something? Volume up, volume up. No woman, no crying. Oh. Yes, actually, he's he's sleeping. <laughs> Completely sleeping. I am even painted. I need to swim. I, I'm postponing this for like, what, already two days or something like uh -huh. that. Uh, uh, please uh, use your tools. The ice is about uh, one meter deep. Uh -huh. So we'll make a small mine.
some technical issues here one of the tubes is uh, broken and uh, our cooling liquid is, is gone so basically engine is boiling right now I, I cannot recognize the distance anymore I don't know if the camera can see the lights on the shore but how far away it is I don't understand I think it's around 20-40 kilometers okay so we need just water now right water is coming freezing We did it. How many days it was? Eight? Seven? Seven. 980 kilometers? Yes, but actually a big thing, huh? Big thing. Yep. <coughs> but we did it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> no. Looks off you. Mm. Mm. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> okay. Well, I've had a brilliant trip here on Ishigaki, but now it's time for me to return to the mainland. We'll be serving up another brilliant show for you next week, though, when... In our Dubai special, Lucy will be at the delayed Expo 2020, where 192 countries have come to present their own unique visions of the future. Plus, you'll be visiting a truly spectacular tropical biodome and trying an inflatable assault course with a difference. <laughs> OK, so that is a lot harder than it looks. So join us for that if you can. And don't forget, we're online at BBC Travel and you can catch up on any programmes you might have missed over on the BBC iPlayer. But until next time, from all of us here in Japan, it's goodbye.